What are the stories of now? That's where we are now. But sometimes telling the stories of now means looking back. 200 models later, representatives from seven Hampton Road cities. There seems to be only one really hot new toy this year. For the next half hour, step with me into the 13 News Now vault. We're kind of an example of how we're still striving for equality for everybody. See that landing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have been in two stores and this is it for me. We'll look back at stories from the last four decades to see how our community has changed. Plus, we'll introduce you to the people who are using their own stories and struggles to make a positive impact on generations to come. This is a special presentation of the 13 News Now Vault. Thank you for joining us. I'm Philip Townsend. Now we're all about the stories of now here at 13 News Now, but sometimes telling those stories means we have to go back in time. That's what the 13 News Now vault is all about. For the next half hour, I'll be taking you back 10, 20, 30, even 40 years to see how what happened back then is impacting us today. We'll start with the story of a woman who is still blazing her own trail decades after Title IX first passed. Evie Odom never got the chance to compete in high school or college. But her love of sports has come full circle after a generous donation to a local university. <laughs> she grew up in a small town in western Massachusetts. A natural athlete, Evie Odom, was always drawn to sports. Very early on, um, I was, back then we used to call it a tomboy, right? <laughs> it was running that really did it for Evie. But unlike her brothers, the opportunity to compete in high school and college just wasn't there at the time. <sighs> I, I just feel like I wish it had happened sooner. Title IX wasn't passed until 1972. It states no person on the basis of sex be excluded from any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. People told her she couldn't throw. It made me feel bad. Despite the landmark law, Looking back into the 13 News Now archives, women were still fighting for the right to compete in the 80s and 90s, decades after its passing. They have not been treated those, treating those athletes fairly. So when Evie met ODU women's golf coach Mallory Hetzel a few years ago, and they hit it off as friends, a $500,000 donation to the program seemed like the perfect investment in her new favorite sport. I lacked the opportunity, and I saw an opportunity to um, make that right for other people. As a coach now, a little bit older, you're so much more appreciative of the women that have come before you. A champion for the next generation of female athletes, Evie now has her own place in Title IX history. The team at ODU renaming their home tournament the Evie Odom Invitational. And Evie never, never gave up on her love of running either. She still competes in marathons all across the country. Now, a lot of these vault stories will inspire a sense of positivity, kindness and empathy, feelings that haven't always been happening naturally between different groups of people. In this story, we're taking a look back at a project that opened hearts and minds more than 20 years ago. It's the beginning of a journey. A journey that started in November of 1998. We've gone through a whole lot of the same stuff, maybe not the same way, but a whole lot of the same stuff. The trip would take former 13 News Now reporter David Brandt to pivotal places in the Civil Rights South. It was an effort called Operation Understanding. They were trying to take African American and Jewish teens and bring them together and to they foster empathy and understanding and compassion. Six black students, six Jewish students from the area with open minds and open hearts. They walked the bridge in Selma, the Evan Pettus Bridge. We went to Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta where Dr. King, where he was pastor. You got some brokering power. We're kind of an example of how we're still striving for equality for everybody. They also visited this synagogue in Atlanta, bombed because the congregation supported African Americans' right to vote. I hope that this trip is transformative for every single one of you. All in all, it was five days of learning, understanding, and growing from shared experiences. It was a journey that had a big impact on David, too, something he thinks a lot more of us could benefit from today. You know, with a little understanding, you know, bring more of those people back into the arena and they're, they're engaged in, in civic dialogue, you know, we might be able to 
get this country back in a more positive direction, I guess. And Operation Understanding DC is still active. The nonprofit's signature program is the so Social Justice Fellowship. It's a transformational year-long program for high school juniors. Keeping with a the theme of understanding people and their different backgrounds, a huge part of African-American culture is only recently getting federal recognition. We're talking about Juneteenth. The holiday commemorates the emancipation of enslaved African-Americans in the U.S. And more than 20 years before it became a federal holiday, a woman was determined to raise awareness in our area. The year was 1997, 131 years after the very first celebration in Texas, Juneteenth arrived in Hampton Roads. Representatives from seven Hampton Roads cities gathered in the basement of the Francis Land House in Virginia Beach. Although this is about uh, history and education, it's also a lot of fun, and it is not about pointing fingers for pain or any of that kind of stuff. It's about having fun and celebrating Southern history in Virginia, and uh, that's what this is all about. One Portsmouth woman made it all happen. Uh, when I first started, it was uh, June who, June what? <laughs> Sherry Bailey spent months planning the area's first festival 25 years ago. Even she admits she had never heard the word Juneteenth until spending time at an event in California back then. I realized a lot of the history that was taught, that we were talking about was my local Hampton Roads history. Sherry is a playwright, and from the very first celebration locally, she's used her knack for storytelling to entertain and educate a reason many people in the region knew what Juneteenth was well before it became a federal holiday. And that's been uh, a, a really wonderful tool in terms of helping people look at this difficult history. It started with one woman and one celebration in 1997. Today, more than 30 events across Hampton Roads make Juneteenth, Virginia, a source of pride for us all. And we are just scratching the surface of what the 13 News Now Vault holds. Still to come, the recent Ghostbusters revival that inspired a new generation of fans. But here in Hampton Roads, one fan of the original movie had a lot to celebrate ahead of opening night. And it is a critical time for malls with the rise of online shopping. But as we look back on the grand opening of one local mall, we'll find out things aren't so different now than they were then. Nearly four decades ago, it became an instant classic. The movie Ghostbusters, it premiered in 1984, and a recent sequel reminded fans, old and new, what they love about the franchise. And I met a Chesapeake man who brought a youthful spirit to the premiere of Ghostbusters Afterlife. 37 years after the original movie. It has a gunner seat? Ghostbusters Afterlife is set for opening night. And over in Chesapeake. There's one man. We'll turn the lights on, turn the sirens on. Ready to arrive in style. You can make a proton pack, some schematics online. There's a That's Jeremy West. I saw the original film in the theater when I was a kid in 84. We came, we saw, we kicked it. He's a member of Ghostbusters Virginia, a nonprofit that lets him turn his favorite hobby into a good cause. When people see the Ghostbusters car driving around, they see us in costume, they get excited. It reminds them of the old movies. Uh, but more importantly, I wanted to be involved in a group that did something good for the community. He and other Ghostbusters fanatics from the group will be at Kemp's River Cinema Cafe Friday night and the Edinburgh location Saturday night. It's a chance to see the new movie, see the Ecto-1 replica up close, and 100% of the profits from taking pictures with the team and trying on the gear will go to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. It's an effort close to Jeremy's heart especially help children, I, I wanted to be a part of that. While staying true to the spirit of the original Ghostbusters from 1984. It's very satisfying. I love those movies. All right, Ghostbusters Virginia is an active nonprofit too. They hold events all across the state. Still to come, it's revolutionized our lives in just about every way, the internet. And we've come a long way since it first started. And later, getting your hands on the season's hottest holiday gifts has always been difficult, but there's a place in Virginia Beach where you might have some luck finding the must-have items from decades ago.
All right, welcome back. This entire half hour, we're taking a trip back in time to bring you the stories of the 13 News Now Vault. And right now, we're heading back 40 years to meet a Navy veteran with a passion for model building. He probably didn't know at the time he'd inspire people for decades. 200 models later, he's recreating one of the two most famous ships of the Civil War. The year was 1982. We were just getting to know World War II veteran Tom Tragel. Of course, this is a Union vessel, but, uh, you know, we, that's all behind us now. The renowned model shipbuilder was commissioned by the Navy to create a replica of USS Monitor. Divers found the wreck of the Civil War vessel off Hatteras Island. Tom's masterpieces would end up in museums all over the country. Six of his models are at the Smithsonian. But years before his legendary career in the craft took off, Tom was a founding member of the Hampton Roads Ship Model Society. He founded or co-founded the club in 67, which is the year I was born. Today, Greg Harrington is the society president. Things have changed a lot over the time, but a lot of the way the clubs run and the fact that the club is still exists 50 plus years later is um, still attributed to, to Tommy. Tom died in 1989. But his legacy of precision and attention to the smallest of details this is, very good. is alive here at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News. The, the longer you look at it, the more you see. This is where the society meets on the second Saturday of every month, sharing and appreciating their craft. Like Greg's Portuguese cargo boat here, a model he worked on on and off for 10 years. A lot of off and a little on. <laughs> and none of it would be possible without Tom Tragel, the prized model shipbuilder we first introduced you to back in 1982. You know, you think about all the people that came before you and all the time and energy they put into it, you're grateful. They are true artists and engineers, and the society still meets on the second Saturday of every month at 10 a.m. All right, check this one out. He was just seven years old when he made aviation history, a record that still stands today, and it all went down right on the Outer Banks. I caught up with the record-breaking pilot to see what he's up to today. It was 1991, and a history-making moment in Kill Devil Hills. It may not have been a picture-perfect landing, but what do you want from a seven-year-old who doesn't even have his driver's license yet? We were there as Daniel Shanklin became the youngest person to pilot a flight across the country. He was just seven years old. See that landing? Oh, yeah, trying to make it the best it was a war. <laughs> Today. <laughs> Daniel, 31 years later, is seeing the video for the first time. I've never seen this video before in my life. I've never seen this. I was not local. I'm sure there was kind of little stories here and there that I missed. To this day, he's still the youngest pilot ever to do it, a hobby that was inspired by his grandparents. You know, it's an expensive hobby. <laughs> and that's why his jet-setting days are behind him. Daniel is now a software developer and a devoted husband and dad in Sugar Mountain, North Carolina but he hasn't forgotten how important it is to set big goals. I tried to copy some part of this for my own kids. Uh, I took them on a 50 state journey back in 2018. They were five and seven. And like dad, they already have that need for speed. Now 11 and eight, Wyatt and Colleen ski race competitively. And yeah, they're well aware of dad's big accomplishment way back when. An accomplishment Daniel says does not define who he is. Still, there's one thing he wants to clear up. That landing. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that how it always works? I mean, there was a big crosswind, so bounced a couple wheels, thankfully touched and down just, just fine, you know? So I'm still here today, not worried about it. <laughs> Daniel's a great guy, and here's part of the reason his record still stands. The Child Pilot Safety Act, that took effect in 1996. It essentially prevents young kids from setting flight records. But in the five years between Daniel's flight and that law, no one younger than him made that kind of trip. All right, let's stay in 1991 for a minute. It was a different time back then. No streaming TV, no social media, of course, no smartphones. In fact, we were just getting the thing responsible for it all. The technology is still being refined. The year was 1991. We didn't know it at the time, but the world and the way we live and interact in it was about to change. Now you can find them on HamNet, the ham capital of the internet. Ham. Wait, no. The internet. Yeah, the internet. 
was starting to become widely available to the public for the first time. It's sort of the new thing to do. One look at our archives and it's clear. Okay. We were still trying to figure out what the internet was and how it worked. Back then, very, very few people had the internet. Luke Downing uh, was just 12 at the time. Now he runs his own IT company, Mode 5 in Norfolk, a lifelong computer guy. Um, the early internet days were dial-up internet, so uh, my business partner, Matt, we were friends back then, and he would tie the phone line up 24-7. Yeah, those dial-up days in the mid to late 90s are when we really started to see widespread use, and that sound that would end up defining a generation. <laughs> Welcome. You, you got, got mail. mail. It's a sound our parents really hated. <laughs> America Online is a big part of the internet story and how it became mainstream. It's a long story that's still being told. The World Wide Web, e-commerce, social media. There's so much good, bad, and plenty of ugly. So what's next after 30 years? Downing believes it'll be blockchain most commonly associated with cryptocurrency. It's got plenty of applications that we haven't tapped into, applications that he thinks will be revolutionary in a pretty familiar way. And it's really at the very beginning stages, and I think what we're gonna see with blockchain is that right now feels like the early 90s. And the internet, internet dates back a little bit before the early 90s. That's just when people started using it widely. It's official birthday. It's January 1st, 1983. And before the internet and this rapid spread of information about big things happening around town, there was still a lot of buzz about this, Greenbrier Mall, which changed shopping for people in Chesapeake when it opened its doors in 1981. Turns out things weren't so different then than they are now. <laughs> The year was 1981. Betty Davis Size by Kim Carnes was number one on the billboard. She's got the top grossing movie, Superman 2, starring Christopher Reeve. I believe this is your floor. Outside Tidewater's newest mall was a sea of cars. Inside, there were waves of people. And on October 7th, Greenbrier Mall here in Chesapeake opened for the first time. We were there for opening day 40 years ago. You know, we needed a mall like that. And they got it. 900,000 square feet of shops and dining. Sears was the big anchor store at the time. It was the only local mall with interstate access. Yes, it was a good time for there because we had no mall to go to. We had to go to Military Circle to go to the mall. Ethel Lawrence remembers. I worked here and 1989, 90. She was a custodian at the mall back then. People watching in its prime. Yes, I did. I seen plenty of people walk through this door, this mall. We can assume a lot has changed since then, but you'd be surprised. Even though not all the mall space has been rented out, the developers remain optimistic with an eye towards expansion. But that is almost the exact situation the mall's in today. Sears closed its doors in 2018. Like any mall in America, vacancies have become pretty common. And last year, because of traffic concerns, the city shot down a proposal to bring a Rosie's Gaming Emporium to that vacant space. And really what we're looking at right now is entertainment. You know, what can we bring to the community that's new and different? That's Christina Cercelli with CBL Properties. They own Greenbrier Mall. Quick to admit, it's been a tough decade for in-person retail. But their numbers this year, sales-wise, are better than they were in 2019, hoping to build on that momentum by pursuing similar projects to Rosie's. You know, industries took a hit, but we're bouncing back pretty strong. And even if that is an uphill battle, we've got 40 years to look back on. And today, that is something to celebrate. I really like this. Shopping has definitely changed a lot since that mall opened. But there's still a place where you can go to find some of the classics from way back when. I'll show it to you next.
We have time for just one more story from the 13 News Now Vault. In this one, we're looking back on some of the hottest holiday toys and gifts from decades ago and where you can still find them in Hampton Roads today. The day after Thanksgiving not only means eating leftovers, but for some stores, the biggest shopping day of the year. Black Friday is almost here, and it's got us thinking about one thing. Toys. Skateboard, Barbies. Looking back long before online shopping, there was nothing quite like going to the mall in the 70s, 80s, and 90s and staring at your wish list items in storefronts. Quite a lot going for the robot toys, the GoBots, the Transformers. For parents back then, may have been a different feel. There seems to be only one really hot new toy this year, but we can't show it to you because this toy store, like many others, is already sold out. It's called Teddy Ruxpin. I have been in two stores and this is it for me. My son didn't play with turtles much. Today, three decades later, there's a place in Virginia Beach. It's a time capsule. Offering you a second chance to get those beloved, once hard to find toys. It's, it's a way for people to relive their childhood. That's Rick Womack, the man behind Toy Meister at the Antique Mall. On a regular daily basis, I will hear someone let out a scream. And a collection featuring almost a million toys, a 15,000 square foot maze of new and vintage Transformers, Ninja Turtles, Barbies. How about a Star Wars collection the size of most toy stores? There's something for everyone out there. G.I. Joe's, a lot of these I haven't seen since I was like eight or nine years old. Some people just come to browse because it's like a museum. So you can stick to online shopping this year, but if you want a big hit of nostalgia, you know where to go. So whether you take it home with you or not, all those memories start flooding back. Oh, and the Teddy Ruxpin, they've got that one too. Oh, I spent a lot of time in there that day. Toy Meister, it's near Lowman's Plaza off of Virginia Beach Boulevard, and it's still open in Virginia Beach seven days a week. That's all we have time for today. We hope you've enjoyed this trip back down memory lane as much as we've enjoyed putting it together for you. And you can find these stories and so many more all on our website. Search 13 News Now Vault. Happy reminiscing.